In the last video, we got a brief introduction to what calculus is and the, the two problems basically that calculus aims to solve, looking at slopes of curves, instantaneous rate of change, areas under curves, and we were able to see that we, we need to make values maybe really close together, really small, really large. We need this idea of a limiting process. Right, so what we'll do for the next couple sections in chapter two here is develop mathematically how we were how we're able to find what we call a limit, and specifically in this video we'll look at limits graphically and numerically, and then we'll explore some other techniques and and talk more about limits and how they pertain and help us solve that kind of first problem, working with a, a tangent line or or slope of a curve. So in this video I want to explore how we find a limit graphically. And numerically, and I'm going to do it with a series of examples and talk about different situations and things to look out for and, and really kind of um, describe the notation of how we write these things down. So first, what I want to do is I want to consider uh, the function f of x equals x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2. And I've chosen this function specifically because I quickly observe with the denominator here that I cannot plug in 2 f of 2 is undefined, okay? And that's an important thing to understand here. I can't actually plug in 2. But I want to see what's going on. My goal here is to determine the behavior, figure out what's going on with my function, f of x, as x does what we call approaches 2. What's going on when x is kind of honing in on 2? Is my function growing? Is it shrinking? Is it is it closing in on one specific number? What, what's going on? And there's some nice techniques to be able to do that. If we had a, a graph, we can usually tell pretty easily kind of what that limit is or what the behavior is of the function. I don't have a graph of this guy. I could find one relatively easy. The, the way you typically learn to graph functions at the start is to kind of plug in values. So I want to kind of do that, and we'll be able to kind of determine that behavior as we plug in values. So let's plug in some x's, some x values, to observe what happens with f of x here. So I've got a, a table of values set up. I've used a calculator, uh, an online calculator, to determine these. So I've got my function there, and I'm plugging in values that are, are kind of getting close to 2. I plugged in 0, I get 2. I plug in 1, I get 3. And I'm going to start kind of getting closer and closer to 2, but from numbers from x values that are less than 2. So I'm going to plug in like 1.5. I get a 3.5. Plug in like 1.9 is closer to 2. I get a 3.9. Plug in 1.99. I see a 3.99. One more here, we get a little closer, one more decimal point out, I get 3.999. You can keep going, of course, I could plug in 1.9999, so on and so forth. We know that when we plug in 2, I get a value that's undefined. Okay, I'm going to repeat this kind of process, but for x values that are just larger than 2. So 2.001, for example and I get a value of 4.001. If I keep going, of course, again, I can make it closer to 2 than that, 2.0001. But I think this gets the point across. To make the uh, the table a little bit more uniform, plug in, say, 2.01, 2.1, and a, and a 2.5. So as we kind of zoom in, when x is getting closer to 2, what we say is kind of from either side, we see that our function looks like it's getting closer to probably about 4. So as I come in for x's that are smaller than 2, my function is approaching 4 from what we say would be like below, right? Those values are smaller than 4, below, they're below 4. And from the values of x that are larger than 2, 2.001, 2.01, so on and so forth, my function is getting closer to 4, but we say it's from kind of above, right? Those values, 4.001, 4.01, those are bigger than 4. So the way we kind of come to a conclusion here is we see that both sides, as x is approaching 2, are kind of coming into the same value, and that value looks like 4. So we say that the limit 
of f of x as x approaches 2 is just 4. Okay? So we've written that in words, and what I want to do is actually develop a notation. Uh, but in general here, or, or this, this idea, the idea is that even though we cannot plug in 2, even though x cannot be 2, we can move x arbitrarily close to 2, and as a result, then, f of x becomes arbitrarily close, or closer and closer, to 4. Right? This is what that idea of a limit really is. And we use some notation to write that down. Right? We don't want to have to write you know, full-on sentences every time. We want a, kind of a shorthand way to do this. The notation goes like this. We say that the limit, lim, as x approaches 2 of my function there, is 4. Okay? And of course, this specific example, things kind of work out the way we want them to, you know, what we expect. But in general, we want to be able to kind of zoom out and handle different situations kind of in the same way. We want this to work. We want to have a notation for all sorts of, of situations. And that's where the power in this really is. I don't want to have to look at each individual scenario. I want this to work kind of in general. So in general, we say the following thing. If f of x becomes arbitrarily, there's that term again, close to L, just some letter, as x approaches C, now it's important to note that x might not be able to be C, then the limit of f of x as x approaches C is L. Okay, so x becomes close to L as x approaches C. We say that the function f of x has a limit, and that limit is L as x approaches C. We write that very similar to how we wrote the last example there. The limit as x approaches C of f of x is L. Okay, and again, this x is not equal to C. The limit is not the same as the function value at least necessarily, okay? I can't plug in C sometimes. In that last example, I couldn't plug in 2. So the limit as x approaches 2 happened to be 4, even though f of 2 was undefined. So those two things aren't necessarily the same. And I want to accent this on purpose because there are situations where we can plug in C that doesn't necessarily mean the limit is the value we get when we plug in C, okay? So there's some things, really limits are this idea of approaching. What's the behavior of the function like as X approaches that C? Let's look at some other examples here. Describe the behavior of F of X is equal to X all divided by square root of X plus one and minus one then near x equals 0. And of course, 0 is the interesting point here, the interesting x value, because f of 0 is undefined. Okay, so again, I've got no idea what this looks like. Let's look at a table of values here. I'm just going to give them all to you instead of plugging them in one at a time. And I've plugged in some values, of course, kind of on either side of 0 to see what's going on as x gets closer to 0 with my function there. So I want to look at kind of both sides of things. As x approaches 0 from values that are smaller than 0, we say x approaches 0 from the left. Okay, We're approaching it from the left. The numbers I'm working with are smaller than 0. And we use a specific notation to show that. We use a little minus sign in the exponent. Okay, From the left side, we see that the function values 1.94, 1.994, 1.9994, they're getting closer and closer to 2. So what we say is the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of our function is 2. On the left side of 0, my function is approaching 2. It's approaching 2 from below, but regardless, it's going to 2. Similar argument from the right-hand side. As x approaches 0 from the right, oh, I'm sorry, Got ahead of myself. We call this the left-hand limit. 
or the limit from the left. Okay, We're going to look at a right-hand limit. As x approaches 0 from the right, my x values are larger than 0. And we use a similar notation here. It's just a plus sign in the exponent. We see that our function has a very similar behavior as x approaches 0 from the right. 2.04, 2.004, 2.0004. We're getting closer to 2 from above. We say the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of our function here is 2. This is a right-hand limit or a limit from the right. And since these values match, since we get 2 from both the left and both from the right, then we can say overall the limit of our function here is 2. Okay, Even though I cannot plug in 0, as I approach 0, both from the left and from the right, I get 2. That's what the limit of this function is as x approaches 0. Okay? But this idea from the left and from the right is a very natural thing to come in from either side of that c value. And we'll do this really frequently. I'm going to look at it again in, in the rest of the examples here. But it's, it's something that we hit on kind of regularly and that we use in, in a multiple definitions later. Let's look at another example here. Find the limit as x approaches minus 1 of f of x, where f of x is this piecewise function. Ooh. Okay, so I've got it defined so that when x is not 1, when x is not 1, my function has a value, I'm sorry, when x is not minus 1, my function has a value of 1. And when x is minus 1, my function has a value of 0. Okay, so what I want here really is the limit as x approaches minus 1, of f of x, which is this piecewise function. Okay, let's look at a table of values again. So what I've got here, and it looks a little goofy, but that's just because that online system makes me plug it in a specific way. But that is that piecewise function that we've got written on the left. I'm plugging in values that are closer and closer to minus 1. Notice the difference here from the last two examples. I can actually plug in negative 1. When x is negative 1, I get a y value of 0. I get a function value of 0. But the behavior of the function, both on the left and the right, is different than what the function value gives me. So there's some deception going on here. I look from the left. As x approaches 0, or I'm sorry, as x approaches minus 1 from the left, it looks like I'm coming in to still 1. I know, I know I've know i got that arrow kind of pointing to 0 here, but the function is behaving like 1 from the left. Now on the right, excuse me, on the right, I see my function approaching 1 again as x approaches minus 1 from the right. So what we can say here is that as x approaches minus 1, it looks like my function is approaching 1. And again, that's a little deceiving. I can plug in minus 1 and I get 0. Why is the limit 1? And I want to use a graph here to help kind of emphasize the, that reasoning. So let's put a graph up here. Again, try to remember when x is not minus 1, my function is 1. So I've got this picture here, and this value up here is, is indeed 1. So when x is not minus 1, I get a function value of 1. And when x is minus 1, I get that value of 0. We can see that down here. Uh, from the left and from the right, from the left, x approaches minus 1. My function approaches 1. I'm, I'm coming in to the left of minus 1. The y value is still 1. From the right, I get a similar type behavior. My function approaches 1. These match, so the limit of my function as x approaches minus 1 is 1. And I know that's goofy, but the behavior of the function is 1 as I approach minus 1. So that c value is minus 1. The l value, the limit, is 1, even though I can plug in 0. Okay. I'm going to do another similar example with a slightly different piecewise function, and, and we're going to see kind of what happens. Here now, I've got 
f of x is 1 when x is less than 0, and minus 1 when x is greater than or equal to 0. Again, I want the limit near 0 as x approaches 0 of my function here. And I'm going to go right to a graph of this guy. All right, and I, I can graph this by hand pretty easily. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in a screenshot again. Um, but when x is smaller than 0, I have a function value of 1. And when x is bigger than or equal to 0, I've got a function value of minus 1. So I've kind of colored in when x actually is 0. I can plug in 0 to this function and get minus 1. But I want to look at the behavior around 0. Okay? So again, from the left, from the right, as x approaches 0 from the left, my x's are less than 0, my function value is 1. My x's are less than 0, my function value is 1. Okay, from the right, from the right, my x values are bigger than 0, my function value is minus 1. Okay, and that's from the definition of this piecewise function here. My x's are bigger than 0, my function value is minus 1. These do not match. I'm going to write the left and right hand limit here. The limit as x goes to 0 from the left is 1. The limit as x goes to 0 from the right is minus 1. These guys do not match. f does not approach the same value, a single finite value, that finite is going to be important, as x approaches 0. So what we're able to say here is that this limit actually does not exist. The limit does not exist. We typically say, say things like this. Uh, it's tempting to say the limit is undefined, but really we say the limit does not exist. There's not a single value that my function approaches as x approaches 0 from both the left and from both the right. Okay? So, we've got our first instance of when a limit does not exist here. Even though we can plug in 0, the limit near 0 does not exist. Right? It's an interesting thing. So what we've really got here is kind of our first instance of non-existence, and there are a couple others. I want to talk about types of limit non-existence. So the first one is exactly what we just described. What happened there? We approached two different values from the left and from the right. And I'm going to draw kind of another little picture, some generic function here. Here's my function. Near C, I approach two different values. One of the values from the left, we'll call it maybe capital M, and a different value, maybe call it capital N, from the right. So from the left and from the right, these limits, one-sided limits, do not match. So therefore, the limit as x goes to c does not exist. Okay? That's the first type. We approach two different values from the left and from the right. The next type here is if f increases or decreases without bound. Okay? So what that looks like is maybe something like this. If I draw some generic function near C that increases or decreases without bound. So if I approach C either from the left or from the right, my function just continues to get larger and larger. So this limit does not exist because I'm not approaching a single finite value, finite value from the left and from the right. I can't really put a cap on that function as I approach C from either side. The third and final type of limit non-existence is, a, is a, an interesting one. F oscillates between different values. Oscillates, okay? So that means it's gonna bounce between different values. So one example of this here is say F of X is equal to sine of one over X which has this sort of crazy oscillating behavior. And what we can say is that this function kind of always bounces between minus 1 and 1 as I approach it from either the left or from the right. It's going to bounce between those values, and that's not completely obvious based on that scribbled picture I've drawn here. But if we explore this further, we're able to kind of see that 
as x gets closer and closer to, in this case, zero, I'm bouncing between two different values all the time, and I can't kind of make it stay towards just one value. So that's the final situation where a limit does not exist. Okay, that kind of wraps up what I have here from, from numerical and graphical limits. We've also got some types of non-existence here. We're going to do some more examples in class. And next, we're going to talk about how we evaluate these limits kind of by hand, algebraically, working through some algebra to better determine the value of some of these limits.